Welcome everybody to Costa Hall for this our uh, first after lunch session. I'm here to introduce the uh, amazing Paul Fenwick, internationally acclaimed speaker, Paul uh, Pearl trainer and fanatic, <laughs> and all around amazing guy, Paul Fenwick. Woo! Thank you. About uh, <laughs> machine ethics and emerging technologies. Thank you, everyone. Uh, just to quickly check, everyone can hear me okay? Wonderful, good. Um, so today I'm talking about machine ethics and emerging technologies, um, or as I like to put it, the future will be awesome and what you can do about it. So when I was a kid, I grew up and I loved watching spy movies. And uh, there was an abundance of spy movies when I was growing up. And what I liked about them was not the, the intrigue and the action and everything, I liked the gadgets. And some of the gadgets that I saw were incredible. So one gadget was a cigarette lighter, or sorry, a cigarette that was also a rocket launcher. There was a car that was also a submarine. And the one which I wanted more than anything else was this amazing digital watch that was also a label maker. <laughs> but there was always one gadget that really, it didn't sit very well with me. I thought, this isn't something that would happen. And it was a car that knew where it was and what streets were nearby. And I thought, that's not realistic. How would the car ever know where it is? And, and how would it ever know what streets are nearby? That's impossible. That would never happen in my lifetime. And of course, as we now know, that's something which is possible, and it fits in my pocket, and I carry it everywhere. And the thing which I've learned from this is that the future arrives very, very quickly, often much faster than we expect. And that's a problem for me, because I like to talk to people about the future. But if I want to have a conversation with someone um, about in vitro meat, which is grown in a lab rather than on a farm, if I want to talk about a future where 3D printed body parts is a half billion dollar a year industry, if I want to talk about a future where a machine can truly appreciate what it's like to go to Burning Man, then people tell me that's unrealistic. People tell me that those things will never happen in my lifetime. Now, I understand why people say this. I understand why a lot of future technologies, people say, no, no, that's impossible. And the reason is because a lot of future technologies and the issues surrounding them are very, very scary. And we feel uncomfortable thinking about those scary scenarios. And it's much more comfortable to simply say it's impossible. It's much more calming for us as humans to say that this is never going to happen. But the result is that we tend to go from technology which is impossible to there's an app for that without even having a discussion in the middle and certainly not having a public discussion about what does this mean. So one thing I want to do is teach you all here today one weird trick that I have learned to talk to people about the future and have good conversations. What you do is instead of saying, hey, this technology is about to mature or this technology has just arrived, say, think forward to 1,000 years in the future. Or better yet, think forward to 10,000 years in the future. And imagine all the technological advancements you've seen over the last 20 years or 50 years, and imagine that rate continues forward to that 10,000 years in the future. Imagine that there is a future where children can print prosthetics as a camp activity. Imagine there's a future where in vitro meat is actually consumer affordable. Imagine there's a future where people can have immersive VR entertainment systems in their own lounge rooms. And people go, oh, 10,000 years in the future, we're not talking about existing technology, we're doing a thought experiment. And doing a thought experiment about the future isn't quite as scary. And people go, we're not making a decision. We're certainly not running the risk of talking about anything which already exists. And people are much, much uh, more willing to have conversations when I do this. So I want you to think forward 10,000 years into the future and imagine there might be autonomous vehicles. So I know this is a really like, hard concept to struggle with, but imagine that you could have a car that could drive itself without a human operating it. And then I want you to think about a particular scenario. 
Imagine that you are uh, in one of these autonomous vehicles, you're the, the passenger, there are no drivers now, and the car is driving along a tiny little one-lane road that is carved out of a cliff face. And if you've gone down the Great Ocean Road uh, near Geelong here, you may imagine what that's like. And imagine that your car is driving along, and quite unexpectedly, a child runs out into the middle of the road chasing a ball and trips. Now, this is a tiny little road, it's a single lane, there is no way that that car can stop in time to avoid a fatal collision. But there is one thing that the car could do, and that is the car could choose to drive itself off the cliff, which would sacrifice itself and its occupant, but would save the child. Now, the interesting question which I have here is, should it do that? And you may feel that it should, and it may feel that it shouldn't, and if you feel that it shouldn't, then what happens if it's two children that it would have to hit? What happens if it's five children that it would hit? What happens if the car is also a submarine? So all of these situations are worth thinking about. And at some point, I want you to say, yes, that car should drive itself off the cliff for the greater good. That is something which it should do. And you can imagine scenarios where you're the one who's unfortunately in front of the car somehow. And this brings us into this fascinating realm of machine ethics. How do we program machines to act in an ethical way? And what does it even mean for something to be acting in an ethical way? Because we have a very hard time agreeing on that as humans. And if at this point you're wondering, how does a car know that there's five children in front of them and one is going to cure cancer? It's 10,000 years in the future. The, the car knows. <laughs> but the big question I have for people when I present these ideas to them um, is that pretend there was a car that would sacrifice its occupant and itself for the greater good, would you buy one? Would people willingly buy a car knowing that that car might choose to kill its owner if it thought that was the best thing to do? And if people say, no, I would not be willing to do that, does it mean that we then have a market for unethical autonomous vehicles? Do we have a market for cars which say, hey, I don't care how many school children there are in front, if, if you're going to like, you know, ruin your suit, I'm just going to plow all the way through them. Like, that's a scary idea, but it's one that could possibly come to, to exist. There's another problem as well, or another thought experiment as well that I like, um, and this one we actually have a better answer for. Um, and that's the same example, with the same road and the same cliff face, and the same child that runs out in front. But now, instead of that collision being unavoidable, the autonomous vehicle can stop safely, and nobody gets harmed. Absolutely safely stop, nobody gets harmed. The question instead is how many people would it need to be inconvenienced before you can justify running that child over? So if you have a busy road, and you have lots and lots of cars behind you, and they're all moving at speed, and you have to stop, you're inconveniencing lots of people. Now, I hope that you feel that this is a horrifying question. It should be a horrifying question. The idea that you might kill someone, an innocent person, simply for the convenience of other people, is something that should make you feel uncomfortable. But amazingly, this is a question that we already have an answer for. And the answer, in the United States, is 8 million people. If you are going to inconvenience more than 8 million people, we consider it to be tolerable for somebody to die in a traffic accident. And the way in which we figure that out is very, very straightforward. For every 8 million trips by road, there is a traffic fatality in the US. Uh, the rate of actual injuries, of course, is much, much higher. So if you have autonomous vehicles, that are doing better than that, you're already having them do better than human drivers. And we already consider that to be tolerable because we have not banned humans from driving vehicles at the moment. So that is our basic tolerable level for this problem. The one thing which you can't do is say that nobody should die. Because the, the moment you insist that nobody should ever, ever die uh, as a result of an autonomous vehicle, you find you have these cars which drive along at walking speed. Because what happens if somebody runs out in front of them and tries to throw themselves under the wheel, it has to have time to stop. And you find these vehicles are so inconvenient that nobody uses them. 
But this is an interesting thing to tune, and even though the way in which we'll program the car is in terms of speeds and stopping distances and uh, how much it talks to other cars, cars and road conditions, fundamentally what this boils down to is how many people are going to be injured or die by autonomous vehicles. There's another interesting thing about this landscape as well. At the moment, you have 40,000 people each year who die in traffic fatalities in the United States. And you can imagine a future 10,000 years later where we have only autonomous vehicles. There are no humans at all. The autonomous vehicles are extremely safe because they don't text whilst they're driving. They don't get distracted. They don't get tired. They're always paying attention and they're communicating to the other vehicles around them. So they know what road conditions are like. Uh, they know the possibility of an accident before they occur. So you could imagine a future where there are virtually no deaths whatsoever from road travel, except when there are bugs. And you could imagine there being a bug that in one day kills 2,000 people. Now, even if you have one of those each year, it's a really good deal. That's only 5% of your previous rate. So this, for, in terms of humanity, is fantastic. But you could imagine the concentration of liability which exists there. Instead of it being 40,000 deaths on the road and more or less 40,000 different people who are responsible for those, you instead have 2,000 deaths on the road and one single company that is responsible for all of them. And in fact, the thing which I find most terrifying about the future of autonomous vehicles is what happens when somebody finds a zero-day exploit and what would that mean? So this is a very, very scary scenario, um, and it's also very scary for anyone building a, an autonomous vehicle. So there is a lot of resistance to actually introducing these from the manufacturing side because of that concentration of liability. So one question to think about is how might we change this, or how, is it a good idea even to change this? One thing you might see is a, a legislative change. Uh, this is what I'm personally in favor of, where if you purchase an autonomous vehicle, that comes with mandatory state insurance, which we already see in a large number of countries in the world. And if you ha have an injury from autonomous vehicles, um, which is not due to negligence, which is a different matter entirely, you have a state fund which is able to, to pay for that. So you reduce the liability for the manufacturer. We may see an insurance change which occurs. Um, because these cars will be much, much uh, safer than human-driven cars, you might find that insurance agencies are willing to bear a lot of the risk which exists there. But what I think you will actually see in the future, more than either of those, is widespread corporate ownership of autonomous vehicles and practically no private ownership of autonomous vehicles. So we see this in uh, movies all the time. Uh, if you think of uh, Johnny Cab in uh, the old Schwarzenegger movie, um, that's a situation where you have a, uh, a company which owns these vehicles, but you don't have private ownership. It's essentially a robotic Uber. And robo-Uber is what I think we'll see, not least because there are headlines like this. Dear Tesla, please sell us half a million autonomous vehicles in 2020. And it's unsurprising that that would be the case uh, of Uber and other companies because the largest cost of driving a vehicle is having a human drive it. Your human driver is at least 50% of the costs uh, of moving things around and moving people around. So as soon as we start seeing widespread autonomous vehicles, um, you're going to see them being snapped up by Uber, Uber and other companies. And they'll be able to run almost 24 hours a day. Having them be electric makes a lot of sense. Um, they can return back to base to charge up and for servicing. What this will do is it will change uh, much of the nature of employment which exists. And I'm using autonomous vehicles as an example here. So at the moment in the US, there's about 230,000 uh, taxi drivers and included in that figure are people who are not driving technically taxis, but Uber and Lyft and those sorts of things as well. All of those people, if they go out of a job, that's a fairly big change, but it's a drop in the bucket, a drop in the ocean, compared to the trucking industry, where there are three and a half million full-time truck drivers in the United States. And you don't just have the truck drivers, you have everyone that depends upon the truck drivers for jobs as well. You have your motels, you have your truck stops, you have your gas stations, you have your meth dealers. All of those people need truck drivers to support them. And they're all going to end up being out of jobs. So the 
impact of technological unemployment is quite, quite large. The other thing to be aware of is that something like this with trucks, you don't need the trucks to be able to go completely from end to end. Most of the cost with trucks is paying humans to do those really long hauls, where they're driving for you know, 10 or 12 hours per day, and they're driving thousands of kilometers. You can have robots do that really well. That's the one thing which autonomous vehicles absolutely excel at, driving on a highway in a straight line. So you can still have humans do literally the last mile at either end, and you can have machines doing everything in the middle. So this is uh, a situation known as technological unemployment, and it's not something which is new. Technological unemployment is something that we've seen many, many times in human history, and the one that everybody uh, thinks of best is the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the Industrial Revolution, we saw widespread uh, building of factories, we saw a lot of tasks which were previously performed by hand, now being performed by machines. And there was a lot of fear during the Industrial Revolution. There was a lot of people who earnestly believed that they were going to be put out of a job because you now had machines doing their work, be that making fabric or be that sewing clothes or whatever else. And in fact, there was a law that was passed and uh, I owe this quote uh, to Benno, who's in the audience here. Um, the law was passed in England um, in 1812, and it made, a, it made it a capital offense to harm a robot, or through an action, cause a robot to come to harm. <laughs> that was an actual law that got passed, the Stocking Frames Act of 1812, because you had so many people storming factories and destroying these machines. You have these stories of tailors with literally pitchforks and torches burning down factories because the machines were going to take their jobs. But as we know, we still have tailors. And in fact, tailors today are more efficient because we have sewing machines and because we have looms. But there's a whole lot of jobs which honestly do not exist anymore, and we don't usually think of them. So here's one. This job is a water bearer. So back before plumbing, which is most of human history, we had water bearers, and they would fill up water in their buckets or their carts, they would come to your homes, and you would fill up cisterns in your homes, and you would pay them. So this was an actual legitimate career, and there are some fascinating essays out there on like, how to get started as a water bearer, startups for water bearers, there are guides to this. But these don't exist anymore, because we have plumbing. And with plumbing, water bearers are completely irrelevant, you don't need them anymore. And I feel very much today that one of my roles is being the plumbing of the future. I am replacing humans with small amounts of code. And usually it's not, in my case, it's not uh, shell scripts. Uh, these days it's more Perl and amazingly C sharp. But I'm replacing humans with small amounts of code. And what's important to note here is it's not your manual labor jobs which are being replaced, it's your white-collar jobs, which we are now being replaced by humans, uh, by machines. And this is a problem, because if you see more and more people going out of work with their existing jobs, and we live in a capitalist society where we expect people to have jobs, what happens to those people? How do we handle technological unemployment? So one way that we can do so is with education. Um, affordable, accessible education means that people who have found that they no longer have a job because a machine has taken it, can reskill themselves. And maybe they can become the new robotics engineer or the new AI engineer or the new person working on whatever new thing we have, drone flyer or whatever. But it's essential that this be affordable and accessible. Um, otherwise, you find people who have lost their jobs and they can't reskill. The other thing which we saw about the Industrial Revolution, because there is this interesting idea that, that Overall, the Industrial Revolution didn't impact employment, um, but it did. The result of the Industrial Revolution is that we are working less. We're working much, much less than we used to. Back in the 1830s, the average work week in Western European nations was 70 hours. And these days, it's around about 40 hours. And what I find really interesting is it stabilized around 40 hours. There was actual resistance to bringing it down below that. The other thing which we can see that's occurred during the same time is that leisure has increased dramatically. 
the number of leisure hours which people have in their lifetime is huge compared to what it used to be. In the 1880s, we had about 44,000 hours of leisure per lifetime. Uh, these days, we have about 122,000. And that's not just because we're working less, it's because we are living longer and because medicine has improved so much and people are spending less time dying of various things, which was something that happened a lot in the 1800s. So what do people do um, with all this leisure time? Because this is something that we want to think about. If we have a future where humans have more leisure time, what are they going to do with it? And one thing which I know from looking at history, going all the way back, pictures of cats. <laughs> as far as I can tell, for as long as humans have been exposed to cats, we have been sharing pictures about them. Uh, the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, were famous for this. Um, but as some of you know, I'm a calligraphy enthusiast. Uh, I keep finding these beautiful 16th century manuscripts. And you know what you can find in those? Cats. So obviously, there'll be a lot more cat-sharing pictures. But the other thing which we know that happens when people have more leisure time is an increase in innovation. A lot of people uh, who find themselves in jobs which they're working full-time say, gosh, I'd love to start this business, I'd love to try this idea, I'd love to do this thing, but I can't because I have to spend all of my time working. So if we actually see machines taking human jobs, and humans not having to work, there is a chance that we will see a much, much greater amount of innovation. And this is backed up by an awful lot of studies. So I want you to think forward to what it might be like 10,000 years in the future when machines are able to do almost all of the work. And here is a beautiful image of that, um, and I've got slides online, you can find them later, this beautiful vision of the future where machines are doing most of the work. And what I want you to think about is how would that future work? Because if humans have very few jobs, if machines are better at humans at most jobs, then how do humans fit in? How do humans have employment? Is employment necessary? And if it's not, what does human life look like? I'm personally in favor of an idea of a technological dividend. The idea that because machines have got better at something, that all of humanity should benefit from that. And there's a few ways of doing that. A basic guaranteed income seems to be the most straightforward way and is the one which is gaining the most traction right now. But there are other ways you might see that as well. The one thing which I hope we will see in the future is better names for robots. So you probably can't see it there, but the robot holding the coffee pot is called the Made Without Tears which is a terrifying name for something which presumably is meant to replace a human maid, which is covered in tears. So I hope that in the future we treat each other better. The other thing which is worth looking at these days are these beautiful things, drones. And uh, drones have really taken off uh, in just the last few years. Oh, pun unintended. <laughs> Absolutely unintended, but thank you all, you're a wonderful audience. But drones have really taken off in the last few years. And drones have this enormous potential for good. Um, this is actually one of my favorite drone pictures. This is a delivery drone. And I'm hugely looking forward to when I can order something and a drone will come and drop it off to me, wherever I happen to be in the world. That sounds amazing. Drones are particularly useful when it comes to disaster relief. If you have a situation where the roads are out, uh, where an airport is inaccessible, you can still send drones in. They can drop off medicine, food, blankets, supplies. These are absolutely essential for disaster relief, and they can look for survivors as well. So drones have an enormous impact to be good for humanity. And of course, you know, if you go to the Bay Area, you find things like taco copter. Um, the idea being that you've got an app on your phone and you can ask for a delivery and it just flies your delivery over to you. Um, as far as I'm aware, that is still vaporware, but what is not vaporware is the burrito bomber, um, <laughs> which is a real thing that uh, uh, drops burritos off to you. The burritos have a parachute. So it flies over, it drops this down. There are some beautiful videos online of people getting burrito deliveries in large open fields because you need to run after the parachute. Um, this is great. What I'm not so happy with with drones 
um, which makes me feel a lot more uncomfortable, are things like this. Uh, this is a US military predator drone. Um, it is able to uh, not just locate targets and identify targets, uh, it can execute them as well. And one thing which is still the case with these military drones, the kill-capable military drones, is that humans still have to be involved with that kill decision. So you have a machine which is capable of acquiring a target and absolutely killing that person, but it still needs to ask a human, its human operator, do I have permission to do this? And amazingly, there is a push in the military to remove that requirement. And it's not surprising to see why, because the moment that you require a human to be involved in the loop, you have a way of defeating those drones by jamming. So you have situations where military drones come over the horizon, and if you have jamming equipment, you haul it all out and you point it at the drone, and you see if you can stop it from talking to base. And uh, quite famously, a few years ago, this happened where a US drone, not one of the Predator ones, uh, an earlier model, uh, was landed by Iran. And they managed to allegedly dra jam the drone and convince it to land. And there's a lot of discussions as to how they did this. Was there GPF spoofing attacks? Uh, what is not contested is they got a drone. They got a US military drone, and they were able to pull it apart and, and you know, start reverse engineering. So this is technology where even if you say, oh, we'll just keep it to ourselves, no, it's going to spread. So the idea of a machine which is able to kill someone without a human being involved in the loop, there's a name for this. It's a lethal autonomous robot. And uh, these exist at the moment, uh, but they're stationary. So the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, uh, there are sniper robots there which are able to automatically spot humans and kill them, and there's no intervention required at all. But the fact that they're stationary makes me feel a little bit better. You know where they are. The, one of the advantages of a lethal autonomous robot for the military is that it can't be jammed. It doesn't need to talk back to base. In fact, if you have a lethal autonomous robot, there's no requirement for it to have any sort of radio emissions at all. It can run in a radio silent mode after it's been launched. It goes forth and does its mission. It doesn't even need to talk back to home. So that makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. We're going to increase that discomfort with this beautiful thing. Um, this is a Zephyr solar-powered drone. This is not, thankfully, a military drone, um, but it's a beautiful thing, and it was able to stay in the air for two weeks of continuous time, running on solar power. And um, it was brought back home, it was ordered to land, not because the batteries were running down or it was experiencing any sort of mechanical issues, um, but because there was nothing to prove by having it stay in the air any longer. It had already been demonstrated that this was a solar drone that essentially had unlimited runtime because it was able to run entirely off solar power. The other thing about these drones is they fly very, very high, 21 kilometers up in the atmosphere, which makes them very, very hard to spot. And um, because they can run for a practically unlimited time, they have incredible range. You can launch this somewhere in the world and you can fly it to somewhere else. And uh, that is something that might take months to get there, but you can do it. So these, again, have an amazing potential for good of humanity for things like environmental monitoring. You absolutely want to have these parked over your large oceans, the Pacific Oceans, and like looking at what's going on there with currents, uh, with garbage, with everything else. That would be fantastic because it's a hard thing to do at the moment. You can have satellites fly over, um, but this lets you have them which is much, much closer to the ground. The scary idea is if you have a drone that has unlimited range, that is able to stay in the air indefinitely, and you then give that a weapon and you make it a lethal autonomous robot, that's terrifying. That's a drone that you could launch from anywhere and may years in the future execute its mission without having ever spoken to anyone. And we've seen all the movies about how this ends. It's not good. What this is particularly terrifying for is it enables this idea of, a, of, of anonymous warfare, where you can have actors, which may be state actors or non-state actors, which are able to deploy long-range military forces, and you don't know who they are. 
And the more that you have these sorts of drones becoming off-the-shelf components, becoming easily accessible and available, the harder it is to tell who is responsible for an action. And in fact, this has become uh, such a large issue uh, that the Human right, Humans Rights Watch group has gone to the United Nations and said, we need treaties on this now that outlaw the building of lethal autonomous robots. And I absolutely agree with them. This is something which we should not allow happen. It would be terrible for humanity. In the vein of making us feel uncomfortable, machine intelligence. Um, this is the most fascinating thing. Um, in the two months since I sort of started preparing my slides here, there's been an enormous amount which has changed. So grab me after the talk and I will talk your ear off about recent developments here. But one thing which I find uh, particularly fascinating uh, is Watson. So I don't know if anyone remembers Watson. Uh, back in 2011, uh, Watson was an IBM machine that won Jeopardy against humans. And that was super, super cool, because Jeopardy is a hard thing for a machine to win. It involves interpreting questions and looking up information and giving back, you know, not answers, but phrasing things as questions. It was a hard thing, and it won Jeopardy. That was very, very cool. Now, since then, Watson hasn't been disassembled. Um, the Watson technology has been repurposed. And one of the things which Watson is doing now is pretty much absorbing the entirety of human medical knowledge. And this is super, super cool if you're a Sherlock fan, because it means we now have Dr. Watson. <laughs> and there is lots of fan fiction out there for Dr. Watson. But what we have is an amazing situation where Dr. Watson is actually better than human doctors when it comes to particular cancer diagnoses. And it's getting better and better at this all the time. So you now have a machine which is able to spot cancer before human doctors can do that. Human expert doctors can do that. The other thing which Watson is doing is preparing treatment plans. And in uh, more than 90% of cases, when it prepares a treatment plan, and they always get reviewed by human doctors, those treatment plans have been accepted unchanged. So it's doing a pretty good job of this whole medicine thing, particularly with cancer, which is uh, what it's specializing in at the moment. This has enormous potential for good for humanity. Could you imagine every time you have a blood test, every time you have imaging, every time you have any sort of medical test at all, you also have robot doctors which are running in the background checking to see if they can spot things early. That would be amazing. So where this makes me feel uncomfortable is who's paying for Watson. So one of Watson's employers, if we're going to call them that, um, is a group called WellPoint. And WellPoint are the largest medical insurance agency in the United States. And what makes them particularly interesting is that uh, back in 2010, so before Watson was winning Jeopardy, uh, WellPoint used software to target cancer patients for rescission. Now, rescission is the process where you say, gosh, it's going to be really expensive to pay for all your medical bills. And we have a, a signed document here that says that you will disclose your entire medical history. Um, but when you were six years old, you broke your ankle and you didn't tell us about that. So we're revoking your entire policy. Now, this is something which is quite evil and it even attracted White House attention. Like there has been a lot of controversy about this. So the fact that you now have the world's best cancer diagnostician which is being employed by a health insurance agency that has a history of not treating its, uh, its um, uh, customers with cancer very well, there exists this real question of, is this being used for good? And Watson may be being used for the good of humanity, but you can at least question that, and you can see how you could at least question that. Now, everything which I've shown you in this talk, I've phrased as think 10,000 years in the future, but everything which I have shown you has been a real technology. Everything I've shown you today exists today. It's already been built. But I do want to ask you to think about something when talking about technology, and that is to think about it in terms of the future. So don't think about what does this technology mean now. Think about what does this mean in 1,000 years' time or 10,000 years' time. And if you are building technology or you're involved with technology, will it be doing the best good for humanity? And if it won't be doing the most good for humanity in a thousand or ten thousand years' time, I want you to ask why. 
Is that something where you can change the technology to make it better? Is that something where you can change society to make that better? Is there something else which needs to change so that your technology is doing the most good? Because one thing which I can assure you is that the future will be awesome, but only if we engineer it to be so. Everybody, thank you very much. So, do we have time for questions? We do, excellent. There is a microphone that will be passed around, possibly multiple microphones that we pass around. There we go. Hi, Paul. Mm. You, uh, you focus very much on the downsides of lethal autonomous robots. Yes. But I would like you to focus on the upsides as well. Yes, please. Um, I, I know, I, I phrase it funny, but seriously, they are being deployed instead of landmines. Yes, absolutely. So that actually is an upside to lethal autonomous robots existing. So I, this is really interesting, um, I am reservedly in favour of lethal robots. We're actually seeing war being less lethal than we have before in terms of cost of human life. It's the autonomous part that I'm very, very disturbed about. I think that you still need to have humans being involved in that kill decision, and that needs to be essential. Because the moment you start removing that, you do open up the door to anonymous warfare, and I think that is going to be a very, very different playing field. Paul, you, you already have the, sure. yes. Yep. Um, I, I noted as well a recent article that uh, where the Hong Kong uh, Yakuza is using drones to deliver drugs yes. and the Hong Kong police are using drones to put nets over those drones and the drone operators are all having a marvellous time. Um, yes. But the, the thing that you said about uh, machine intelligence uh, and uh, I, I note many people, you know, Elon Musk and uh, Stephen Hawking, amongst mm -hmm. others, have, have been very afraid of uh, machine intelligence. But I'm, I, I think Jono uh, this morning said that you know, if we can democratise that and give everyone that technology, then that's, uh, that, that's a way of taking the Frankensteins or the monster out of the machine. Is that something that you think is, is going to happen? There is a fascinating discussion to have here about democracy, um, and I'm not sure democracy is uh, the... I think we can do better than democracy, um, is what I want to say there. Um, but I don't think it comes down to democratising the technology. I think it comes down to having friendly technology. Um, because if we take uh, autonomous vehicles, for example, um, if you ask each person, you know, hey, what do you want your car to do? Most people go, oh, I don't want it to kill me. And, you know, it's okay if it kills other people. Like, if it's, if it's me or them, I'd rather that I'm the one who's okay. Um, that does not lead you to an optimal future in terms of the, the most good for humanity. So I think we can actually do better than democracy. I think we can do better than uh, sort of self-interest, uh, or e even ethical self-interest. Um, so I think that we can do better than that. Um, part of the question is how do we make machines friendly? And by friendly, I mean friendly to humanity overall. And um, you read a lot of sort of, I've read a lot of doomsday scenarios where you have like, you know, a, a paperclip machine that's designed to make paperclips and you give it some sort of, you know, intelligence and it goes through an intelligence explosion where it's able to improve itself so that it can make more paperclips. And then one day, everybody dies from like this engineered super virus because that gets rid of all the humans and means it can build even more paper clips because the humans were getting in the way of that. And, you know, that's a, a, an, an example which hopefully will not come to pass, um, but that would be an unfriendly technology. It's something which is not working in the best interests of humanity. And one thing which worries me is that we're looking at... Um, some very, very large companies at the moment which are doing a lot of work with AI. Google is a great example here. And um, I don't think we want to see uh, sort of widespread technology which is optimised to, you know, maximise advertising revenue. Uh, I think that that is not necessarily going to be the best thing for humanity, but it's something which could occur. 
and which hopefully we can avoid. Um, but there are some great discussions about that. Uh, the Lifeboat Foundation has some very, very good discussions here, uh, which is a, a sort of a foundation for looking at how do we preserve humanity and, and not have something which will wipe us all out. But grab me after this talk, and I'll have more, more discussions of that. Yes? Yeah, Paul, you mentioned like, that there is a very rich vein of um, scientific or science fiction writing that covers a lot of this. And yes. despite being well known for his laws of robotics, Asimov actually wrote a short story Mm -hmm. exactly describing the future of autonomous cars and some of these mm -hmm. aspects. I was just wondering, do you think some things like in his writing still have relevance today? Because the future he imagined is, of as you pointed out, is not quite the future that we've inherited. So um, I love science fiction because what science fiction lets us do is think about the future in a safe way. The moment people go, oh, it's science fiction, you can explore all of these concepts, and people don't necessarily feel threatened by that because it's not current technology, it's this imagination thing. So science fiction is great for exploring that. Um, I think one of the things we have a real problem with with science fiction is we tend to humanise a lot of machine intelligences, and we assume that they will have emotions and that they will act like we do, and you know, even this idea that they will be logical and it's, it's no, they will act in terms of fitness functions. What have you programmed? This is what you're trying to optimize for. And I think that the types of intelligences which you'll see that come out of that will be uh, very, very different from what gets imagined in a lot of science fiction. And um, one, uh, I don't know if anyone here was at BuzzConf uh, a few months ago, um, but there was a wonderful demonstration there with a, a speaker who had trained a, a deep learning network uh, to play Space Invaders. And what was very, very clear from watching it play Space Invaders was that it was very, very good at shooting these Space Invaders, and its goal was to maximize the score. And so there was a number of times it would just say, well, I'm just going to take this bullet because it will reset the position of my, uh, uh, of my turret back over to the middle where I want to shoot things. And it's faster than me moving it back there, and that lets me maximize my score. And so the idea of having machines which are like, well, I know that I'm completely replaceable, and so and expendable, that's not something you see humans even going towards. And I was watching a machine last night play Pac-Man, and it had a very, very different way of playing Pac-Man that obviously exploited flaws in the ghost's pathing algorithms. And it would have all these things where it would make these weird little wiggles at precise moments, and the ghosts would, you know, would bug out and they'd go in the wrong direction. And it's like, that's not something which humans would develop. Um, so I think that science fiction is great, um, but we need to be cautious about you know, uh, anthropomorphizing machines too much. Do we have time for any more questions? Yes? Can, can you speak a bit about why the working week seems to have stabilized at about 40 hours, and in particular the theory that work is being created just to keep people busy? I can, I can have conjectures about that. Um, they are not backed up by evidence, so this is purely conjecture on my behalf. And that is that we have this culture that says that humans must work, and work gives you value, and if you are working part-time, obviously that's because, you know, maybe you've got other commitments, but it's not as glamorous, it's not the thing you should be doing, you should be working full-time. And we're raised with this from a very, very young age. Um, that you should grow up and you should get a job and, you know, in the past things were much more sort of you find a career and you stick in that one company for a long time. These days, you know, you see more moving around, but there's still that expectation that you have a full-time job. And I feel that that has been one of the uh, reasons that we've stuck with this 40-hour week, that there is uh, less status associated with being a, a part-time employee or having a less time there. Um, it's a little bit worrying as well because we've also seen in certain areas, tech in particular, the work week is actually creeping back up again. And it's, it seems to be because people in tech are very, very highly skilled. They're very, very highly sought after. And so it's like, let's see if we can squeeze as much time out of them as possible. Um, but I would love to see the actual work week go down. Um, but I think there is a very, very big sort of resistance there. And you probably see a big resistance in terms of um, uh, if I'm going to reduce the work week by law down to 30 hours, you'd probably see a large number of companies saying, no, we don't want to do that. It's going to be more expensive. It'll cut into our profits. And that would also act as resistance. Last question? Hey, Paul. Um, so 
you're looking, you're talk, talking about situations with things like autonomous vehicles where there's certain desirable behaviours, but then they may not be desired by the owners yes. of the vehicles. We all like to own the things that we own, mm -hmm. and we like to tinker, and mm -hmm. we don't like DRM, yes. and we want the freedom to modify them. How does that come into conflict with things like the requirement to maximise good and that if people modify algorithms that are designed to cooperatively work to maximise that good, they're actually potentially causing problems for those systems? That is a brilliant question. I... <laughs> um, so the question was, um, uh, we like to, we're at a Linux conference here, we like to pull things apart and reprogram them. We like to grab our microwave and like make it run Linux. Um, this is, what does that mean with autonomous vehicles if they're designed to work cooperatively together and somebody produces their own hacked car that deviates from that behavior? Um, so one thing which you might see there is that people actually have cars which advantage their, their owner um, and that would not necessarily be good for everyone else. Um, there is a situation, and what I think is most likely to happen is you'll see very, very little private car ownership. Um, the reason for that is that if you are an individual, you drive your car to work, you could park it in a garage, or you could rent it out to RoboUber, and it will make you money by driving people around every day. So I think that you'll find that there'll be fewer people who, who privately owned cars. Um, the ones which do will be rented out more. Um, but the question is, yes, if people then go and hack their cars, what does that mean? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I think like today you'll see very few people doing that, but the ones who do will be advancing technology and advancing ideas. Um, I also think you'll see an enormous amount of DRM which exists where you need to have, like with your phone, you know, a signed image. Um, and with your car, you might see a signed uh, uh, image there as well. And then what happens if you're installing signage and mod on your car and um, doing all this other stuff? So I don't know. Um, and I'd love to think about that more. So I know that's not a great answer to your question, but it's something which I very much appreciate because it means I'll go home and think about that. I, do we have time for any more? Unfortunately no. not. Uh, we're out of time, but uh, I Come hope Come find you'll... me afterwards. <laughs> yeah, I hope you'll join me in uh, thanking Paul. Cool. Thank you. And